Hello, this is Julia Puebla Fortier, and I'd like to welcome you to the Diversity Rx Your Voice webinar series. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the support of the California Endowment for this webinar series, which is a monthly series on how good practice, policy, and research can improve healthcare for culturally diverse populations. Before we actually get started on the webinar itself, I'd like to just do a little bit of introductory material, both about Diversity Rx and also about how um, the webinar will run. Diversity Rx is a nonprofit organization that's been in existence since 1997. We do a variety of different activities and sponsor a number of different events. We have a website called diversityrx.org. We also run the Class Talk Listserv, which is a listserv that provides information about culturally competent practice to um, several thousand people. We run a conference on culturally competent health care, which will be held this fall in Baltimore in October. And we also sponsor the Your Voice webinars, Communities of Practice, and Peer Learning Networks. So just to tell you a little bit about the, how the webinar will work, uh, because we have a thousand people on this webinar today, um, which we're very excited about, all the audience members are going to be muted throughout the entire webinar. But you can submit questions at any time. You just use the question window that's at the bottom of your control panel. And if you'd like, you can indicate if you want your question to go to a particular speaker. Um, to give you a little bit more information about asking the questions, um, please enter it into the question pane, which you can click the plus or minus sign on in your um, attendee control panel. And then when we receive your question, we'll forward those to the presenters, and they'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, if you need to add, um, control your participation in the webinar at all, you can use the GoToWebinar control panel, which sometimes has a tendency to hide up at the top right-hand corner of your screen. If you go there and you select View from the drop-down menu, um, just make sure that Auto Hide the Control Panel is not checked. And that will keep the control panel on your screen during the webinar so that you can find the question window easily. Now, I'd like to go on now to introduce our webinar today. We're very, very pleased to be able to have um, some of our colleagues from the Joint Commission present uh, to us their new standards to improve patient-provider communication. And um, we have three very distinguished speakers who are going to be with us today. Um, we're going to be starting off with Paul Scheibe, who is a senior vice president of the Joint Commission. He's had a very long and distinguished career um, in mental health before he came to the Joint Commission. And since he's been at the Joint Commission, he's been a very strong national advocate for culturally and linguistically appropriate health services, as well as having done quite a bit of work on patient safety, healthcare ethics, and continuous quality improvement. He's going to be joined by Amy Wilson-Strongs, who is the Project Director for Health Disparities Work in the Division of Quality Measurement and Research at the Joint Commission. She's been a driving force behind the study, Hospitals, Language, and Culture, which is a snapshot of a nation and a longtime advocate behind developing standards for better patient communication and class for healthcare organizations at the Joint Commission. We're also very pleased to be joined today by Juana Slade, who is the Director of Diversity and Language Services for AnMed Health in Anderson, South Carolina, which serves the residents of Northwest South Carolina and Northeast Georgia. AnMed Health, which is the state's largest private not-for-profit um, healthcare system has developed a comprehensive integrated diversity program to better manage their increasingly diverse patient population. They've gotten many national recognitions for their work on linguistic and cultural competence, and Juana herself has received many honors for her work in this area. So I'd like to turn things over to Amy and Paul, and they are going to start the webinar for us. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, this is Paul Shivey. And uh, we're very pleased to be with you this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, we're quite anxious uh, to talk with you about uh, the new hospital accreditation requirements to advance effective communication, cultural competence, and patient and family-centered care. The objectives for our time together is first to provide an overview of the Joint Commission's efforts to promote health equity. And Amy will be doing that uh, and with some particular focus on the kind of research that we did uh, as backgrounds to the new standards. 
I will then introduce uh, the Joint Commission Standards for Patient-Centered Communication. And finally, Amy will talk about the roadmap for hospitals, and Juana will talk about the experience of AnMed Health. Amy? Thanks, Paul. I'm thrilled to be uh, here and have the opportunity to talk a little bit about what has um, resulted in some uh, new and revised standards at the Joint Commission. Um, but to kind of set the context, and I wanted to give you some information about what we've done to get to this point. And I would be remiss to fail to acknowledge the California Endowment and the Commonwealth Fund, who were great supporters um, by providing us with the funding we needed to do the research necessary to get to where we are now. Um, many of you may already be familiar with um, this report, which is on this slide. Um, and this is our hospital language and culture uh, report, final report, um, it's entitled Exploring Cultural and Linguistic Services in the Nation's Hospitals. And it was a report of 60 hospitals, and it was really our attempt to better understand in great detail how hospitals are addressing these issues, hospitals across the nation of varying sizes and uh, geographic regions with varying uh, resources are addressing these issues. Um, the report actually came up with uh, 32 recommendations that we made to the field. And I say to the field in the broadest context because the recommendations were not made just to hospitals, but were also made to support further research that is needed, as well as some directives or suggestions for policymakers. And um, we did indeed include ourselves in that, um, in that last category. Uh, and you'll see here the domains in which we address. It's really, as this issue, um, as many of you probably already know, this is a very complicated issue, but it integrates into everything that hospitals do to provide safe, quality care. So we try to take a broad um, a, a brush stroke when we, wanted, when, we, when we had the opportunity to look at these issues. So we look specifically at these six domains of leadership, quality improvement, and the use of data to guide and evaluate services, workforce issues, and um, included patient safety in our evaluation of actual provision of care, and certainly um, look specifically at language services and um, community engagement because this is something that many organizations um, rely on collaborations with, with the community and information from the community. We also, um, from this study, were able to publish a second report that was derived from promising practices that were identified um, at the hospitals we visited. And through all of this work, we, um, we had a really um, solid research team um, of folks who were, were guiding us. In addition, we had a uh, panel of about 25 experts in the area of cultural competence and language access. So what we were able to do was identify some promising practices, and I think we identified about 118 actual practices that met our criteria. And from that, what we wanted to do was uh, uh, instead of putting out a list of practices, we recognized from, under, from, from talking to hospitals, from, from the literature, from our research, that one size indeed does not fit all. Um, how an organization addresses its patients' unique needs has to be done in the context of that organization's resources, structure, mission, vision, et cetera. So what we found, what we did with this report is derived a framework that was based on four themes that came out of the evaluation of these practices. And those themes really promoted the idea that um, Underneath all of this is, requires a self-assessment. An organization must know what its resources and its needs are. Um, and that this is really something that is not a one-time um, uh, achievement, but is an ongoing journey. Um, and we can't emphasize that enough. And we've tried to take these concepts into our standards as we develop the standards. So when Paul speaks to what we what we have developed, I think you'll see that there is a lot of reflection in this idea of using data and continuously evaluating. Um, also for, for folks to, to let you know, there is a self-assessment tool that is in this report, and this report and our other report are also available for free, and um, at the end of the webinar we have links to where you can find these resources. While we were doing our hospital language and culture study, we also took upon ourselves to 
um, uh, begin and move forward with a public policy initiative on health literacy, a very important and inter integrally um, related issue. And you'll see here, this is a copy of the um, report that came out, also available for free. And there are several recommendations that relate directly to this. So what we began to understand through all of this work and, um, and, and understanding these issues and talking to people in organizations um, is that this is broader. While our hospital's language and culture study really was catapulted by the identification of racial and ethnic health care disparities and language access issues and challenges, that this falls within the context of a broader definition of health equity. And this is, in, this is really the framework and the understanding that we are trying to move forward with in the context of our standards. So I'd like to take this opportunity to move forward. I know everyone is anxious to hear about the standards, so I'm going to turn it over to Paul to give us uh, an overview of where, we, where we're starting from and where we're going. Uh, thanks, Amy. Uh, as this uh, uh, slide indicates, uh, and Amy just said, as we were undertaking this process, which began by looking at cultural and linguistic services that would affect uh, disparities in care, if you notice, the uh, title of the second uh, publication was One Size Does Not Fit All, Meeting the Healthcare Needs of Diverse Populations. And obviously, diversity we recognize as, in terms of healthcare is related to more than simply culture and li linguistic services. And then when we moved on to health literacy, we again recognized that there were many factors not necessarily related to cultural and linguistic uh, services that, that uh, impacted health literacy and that that had a major influence on health equity. So by the time we finished, we realized that all these kind of things, education, age, religion, gender expression, gender identity, income, affected health equity. Uh, just earlier this week on Tuesday, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality published this, the 2009 report on the National Healthcare Disparities Report. And in that report, they identified that there continues to be significant uh, disparities based on ethnicity, on income, on education, and, and on race, although race, the disparities based on race seems to have been imp improved a bit. So we know we have a disparities on at least those factors, and many studies have indicated that these other factors on this slide have also addressed, uh, have also created disparities. So if you think about it from that point of view, the real question is, why then should we be worried about disparities in health care? The expert advisory panel that we put together to advise us on the development of the new standards actually said that was an important question, that they wanted to start with an answer to that. And they related it to our society that has core values of equality of opportunity, justice, and comparison, and compassion. And it was clear that you can't have equality of opportunity, justice, and compassion unless you provide health care that is safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, efficient, and equitable. I'm sure that you've recognized that those six uh, aims of the health care system, safety, effectiveness, patient-centeredness, timeliness, efficiency, and equitability or equity are, in fact, the aims that were identified by the Institute of Medicine. So if you now say we'd like to address the issue of health equity, uh, the question would be what kind of factors are involved. And it's interesting to look, for us to look back at how we began to address this. Our first approach to health equity was in the chapter on patient rights in the accreditation manuals, that it was a right of a patient to have communication that they could understand. Uh, we then realized that, in fact, that it was more than just a right. It was part of the delivery of health care itself if we were going to respect the patient's right to participate in their health care. 
So we then started to move beyond simply that this was a patient right and say, and in fact, it's part of what you need to do to enable a patient to participate in health care. More recently, we've identified uh, actual issues with regard not just to the quality of care, but the safety of care. One study that was carried out here by the research department demonstrated that, for example, when patients uh, are, have limited English proficiency, they are more likely to suffer from a medical error. And when they do have a medical error, the medical error is more likely to result in serious effects on the patient than for patients who uh, do not have limited English proficiency. So we've now moved from patient rights to add participation in care to finally to say this really is an element very specifically related to the safety and quality of care. And because of that and because it affects all three of these levels, uh, we realize that it requires an integrated approach at multiple levels. And as Amy indicated earlier, it's important that we have data through ongoing monitoring improvement to, imp to improve what we do in terms of addressing the health equity issues. Now, uh, we actually have been addressing these for a number of years. As I just said, we actually started with the standards that talk about patient rights. So we have had a standard for a number of years that says that patients have a right uh, to have their culture and cultural and personal values re uh, respected, uh, as well as their beliefs and their preferences. Uh, we then moved on to talk more about the idea of what was necessary for particip participation in care. So we've set in standards that the patient has a right to effective communication, including interpreter and translation services, and that that's not related just to limited English proficiency. It also has to do with uh, barriers that come from vision, speech, hearing, or cognitive impairment. We then related that to the issue of the actual and, and patient's informed consent. And finally, we stressed in the chapter that deals with patient education uh, the idea that, in fact, one needs to make sure that the patient does understand uh, what it is that's being communicated and that the, the, the uh, provider understands what it is that the patient is communicating. So let's move on now specifically with that background to, given the, the data from the research that we did, our experience with the, with the existing standards, to developing the new standards. Uh, the standards, uh, as you see from this kind of long title, to advance effective communication, cultural competence, and patient and family-centered care, came about because we realized that Again, there were more barriers uh, to effective, safe care and, and communication than just culture and just language. It was funded by the Commonwealth Fund, and the goals at the beginning were to develop the st standards, they are specifically for the hospital program, that would incorporate issues such as diversity, culture, language, and health literacy. And secondly, the recognition, and this is really the first time we've ever done this, that it would be useful to have a guide that went beyond the standards, that not only would help people understand what were leading practices in terms of, of addressing the actual standards requirements, but also could move beyond that to really uh, move, you might say, forward to make it the kind of improvements that what people can be proud of, not simply that they have, quote, complied with standards, unquote. And so that was to develop a guidance document, and we did that by collaborating with the National Health Law Program. Uh, the issues that we were wanted to address in this project, when we put together the technical expert panel, which I should say, in, uh, had representation from people who were knowledgeable and involved in many of those, uh, those areas that we had on the slide with all the kind of uh, names. So it was not just people who were working in the area of cultural competence, working in the area of language, but that advisory, that technical expert panel, included people uh, from the uh, 
uh, gay, lesbian, uh, transgender, bisexual community. They included people from uh, various religious uh, uh, traditions and ethnic groups. So that we were trying to address the multiple kinds of, of factors that can be barriers to equity in health care. And the, uh, that group identified three basic issues that needed to be addressed. The first was effective communication. Many of these uh, barriers actually will interfere with communication. So how do you identify a patient's communication needs? How do you effectively provide language services? And auxiliary aids for those who have other kinds of barriers from, for communication. The second major issue was the idea of data collection and use. Uh, what information should be connect, collected about the uh, individual patient and how do you use that, uh, that data to develop uh, information about the population that's being served for the purposes of service planning and performance improvement. And finally, how do you make sure just gathering data doesn't help unless you're able to use that data to actually address specific patient needs? And that led to focusing on both the patients and families' involvement in care, how do you make sure that the care is equitable, and how do you address things like cultural, religious, spiritual needs and beliefs? So with that uh, kind of background to what it was that we were trying to accomplish, let's look at the specific new standards. The, the task force, the technical expert panel, actually developed about, I think it was around 22 recommendations. Uh, that would improve care and reduce uh, uh, disparities. Uh, some of those have been turned into standards. All of them are reflected in the guide that I had described earlier that Amy will talk more about. So let's look at the ones that actually were put into the standards. The first one is, as you see, not now inpatient rights, it's actually in the patient care chapter, and it's designed to say this is really part of the patient care process. And that is the issue of effectively communicating when pa with patients when providing care, treatment, and services. The first element of performance is the idea that the, that the hospital identifies the patient's oral and written communication needs, including the patient's preferred language for discussing health care. I want to make an emphasis on the phrase preferred language uh, because, in fact, we, we learned through the, uh, the technical expert panel that sometimes patients will say, this is the language I speak or this is the language that I speak at home, but that may not actually reflect their preferred language for talking about health care. So that's a very specific thing that you'd like to learn from the patient. You also notice that the element of performance starts with the phrase, the hospital identifies. It doesn't say the admissions office, it doesn't say the doctor, it doesn't say the nurse. It's the hospital because the way to do that may differ from hospital to hospital. The, uh, the guide actually will talk about how you might do that in the, in the admission process, how you might do that in the context of the, of the clinical care, but again, one size does not fit all. There may be different ways to go about that. So it's ultimately the hospital as a whole that will figure out the best way to do it within their organization. The note is there to remind people that we're not just talking here about communication needs based, for example, on language, that it includes the need for personal de devices, such as hearing aids, glasses. It obviously does include the need of language interpreters, communication boards, translated or plain language materials. The concept of translated obviously means that languages differ. Plain language is the issue that addresses health literacy. And communication boards is what happens with the patient in the uh, intensive care unit who's intubated? That in fact, you, you can't talk with the patient at that point, or you can talk, but in fact, they can't talk back. 
So communication boards is one of the ways to, uh, to communicate. So the note is designed to say, think broadly about the different barriers to communication and how you might need to address them for any specific patient. And be prepared with the kind of equipment and so on that might be needed for patients with that particular kind of problem. The second element of performance is that the hospital communicates with the patient during the provision of care, treatment, and services in a manner that meets the patient's oral and written communication needs. This is the concept not just of are we using a language that we can understand, but also what other kind of, in, of communication um, media might be useful. Pictures, diagrams, videos, uh, all kinds of, of ways that the real, the underlying issue is you're not going to have safe, good quality health care if, in fact, there isn't good communication going between the patient and the provider. Let's move to the next one, which now is a in the rights chapter, uh, which deals again with this uh, issue of communication in a, a bit more detail. Uh, an existing standard says that the hospital respects the patient's right to receive information in a manner he or she understands. An existing element of performance is that the hospital provides language interpreting and translation services. Interpreting meaning when you're orally uh, in, a, in a real time way, interpreting between two people who are speaking with, other, with each other, translation is when it's a document that's being translated. Um, I should also add as an aside that one of the things that the guide makes very clear is that to have an on-the-fly translation of a document which is necessary, for example, a consent form, is actually uh, uh, often arises, it often creates problems in communication that that on-the-fly translation can also often lead to misunderstandings and even mistranslations. Uh, so from that point of view, uh, that the guide is helpful in laying out some of that additional information about what makes for good interpreting and what makes for good translation services. Uh, the note indicates that interpreting and translation is something which is an a specific skill. It is not something that comes automatically by being, quote, bilingual, unquote, for a couple reasons. One is we've often found that in the experience of organizations, people that they think are bilingual are not as bilingual as they may think they are. And the second thing is that we're talking here about bilingual in, in medical issues, in health issues. And to be bilingual, quite effectively bilingual in everyday life, is not the same as being able to be an interpreter for medical issues. So that's why it talks about trained bilingual staff or our qualified interpreting services, and that it could be provided in person or via telephone or video. Uh, the hospital also needs to determine which of the documents, uh, which of the, the translated documents are needed based on the patient population. If we look at the next uh, standard, it stresses this issue that I've just been talking about in terms of the, the, the qualification to be a, an interpreter. And this, uh, there is a standard here in the HR chapter it talks about the hospital defining staff qualifications. One of the elements of performance is the hospital defines staff qualifications specific to their job responsibilities. And it goes on with a, with a couple notes that talk about some specific types of uh, functions in which one has to pay specific attention to the, uh, to the interpreter's uh, uh, I'm sorry, to the individual's qualifications. And a new note has been added that that's one of the areas that interpretation is one of the areas that me, needs to be looked at and defined in terms of proficiency. And there are a number of ways or combinations of ways to go about that. One is looking at the actual proficiency and assessing it. The second is looking at the education the person has had 
with regard to, for example, health care interpretation of the training that they've had and the experience that they've had. So let's move for a moment now away from the specific issue of uh, uh, the interpretation and translation function and look at the data that we collect about the patient. When we collect data about a patient and we record it in the medical record, we're really doing that for two purposes. One is that it's the way we communicate with each other about a particular patient's needs. And so oftentimes the, the, the completeness of a medical record can in fact affect the quality of care if somebody else who's going to come in and care for the patient, whether it's at the change of shift for nurses, whether it's between the doctor and the nurse, whether it's between one physician and a consultant, if the, if the information is not recorded, there's either duplication of effort or in fact actual errors in care. This is this issue of the role that the medical record plays in handoffs. And that's one of the reasons to make sure that we record important information in the medical record. The other reason is that the information in the medical record can provide us with information about the patient population that's being served, and that information may be important. So here we have a standard that talks about the medical record contains information that reflects the patient's care, treatment, and services. There's a series of elements of performance. One of them is that the medical record contains the following demographic information, as you might expect, name, address, and so on. And, and the, the dot with nothing after it indicates there's a bunch of other things that are, that are to be in the medical record. And here's where the revision occurs. One of those that's been there is that the patient's communication needs. And again, we're adding to, to focus specifically on what is the preferred language for discussing health care. And a note to that is, is that if a patient is a minor or is incapacitated or has a designated advocate, the communication needs of the parent or legal guardian or surrogate decision maker or legally authorized representative is also documented in the medical record. That certainly makes common sense that uh, it's the person you're actually trying to communicate with who you need to know what is the preferred language for that individual. That's, that's information which is obviously relevant specifically to the care of that individual. The second addition is that one of the things that's to be recorded in the medical record is the patient's race and ethnicity. And the reason for that is twofold. One is there's information there that could be useful in understanding some cultural issues about the patient but always with the caveat that one has to be careful not to stereotype, to assume that one knows certain things about the patient because you know the patient's race and the patient's ethnicity. But it's a guidepost to at least alert one that one might need to ask some additional questions to learn about what the potential effects of the patient's race and ethnicity has on the ability to communicate with them and their understanding of what's being said. The second reason for recording that data is that that's the kind of data that when one looks across and aggregates data across a medical record, helps one plan for services. Clearly, uh, such issues as, as what documents do we have to make sure are already translated because they'll frequently be called for them. If we then move to the next standard, uh, this again is one that occurs in the patient's rights chapter, and it says that the hospital allows a family member, friend, or other individual to be present with the patient for emotional support during the course of stay. A little background about this. Uh, many of you are probably aware that in 2002, the Joint Commission began what we call the Speak Up campaign, in which we prepared brochures that are distributed by hospitals and doctor's offices and so on uh, to patients with a series of advice, a uh, number of steps that they can take 
to improve their care and particularly to make the care safer for them. Things that you might expect, like speak up and ask questions, uh, know what medicines you're taking. One of those pieces, one of those steps was to ask a trusted family member or friend to be your advocate, your advisor, or your supporter. When any of us go uh, to see the, a, pay, a, a provider, but particularly when we're in the hospital, we are usually anxious. Even if the illness has not in any way clouded our judgment, we are anxious. And as a result, oftentimes things that are communicated are not remembered later on, or one even forgets the questions that one wants to ask. So the concept of having somebody there, a friend or a family member, to be your advocate is one that actually we now know will increase the safety. So uh, the concept of having somebody with you was we were already encouraging that. We were making that encouragement to the patient. What this element of performance does is say, and the healthcare organization itself should obviously reciprocate, should in fact enable that to occur, uh, which means allowing the family member, friend, or person to be present. The second thing is that those who were on the task for the technical expert panel pointed out that in patient-centered care, it's become clear that patients are much more comfortable when they're in the hospital if they can have a friend or, or family member with them on a much more continuous basis. So the note indicates that the idea of having a family member, friend, or other individual present actually means not just on an on a occasional basis, but that that person can be present to support the individual uh, through the through the hospitalization, including even when they're in the intensive care unit. It was recognized that, in fact, sometimes having that individual there at certain points may infringe on the rights of others, on safety, or is clearly medically or therapeutically contraindicated. But the, expert, the expectation is that under most circumstances, the person would be able to be with them uh, as the patient desires. Which now brings us to the, uh, the final one of the, of the new standards, and that's one that deals with non-discrimination in care. Uh, this is part of the same standard. So we just talked about, in addition to the standards, an element of performance that talks about having a family member, a friend, or other individual there. What we learned was that, and we probably have all read about this from time to time in a newspaper, that in fact uh, sometimes a hospital policy will limit who it is, for example, that can be with the patient. And so this addition was made that says that the hospital, in its, as it sets its policies with regard to patient care, prohibits discrimination based on age, race, ethnicity, religion, culture, language, physical or mental disability, socioeconomic status, sex, sexual orientation, uh, sex or sexual orientation, and gender identity or expression. Many of you may well be aware that yesterday uh, the White House announced that the President had issued a memorandum to the Secretary of Health and, Her and Human Services uh, directing her to develop uh, rulemaking that would require that hospitals participating in the Medicare or Medicaid respect the rights of patients to designate visitors. It should be made clear that designated, I am now reading from that directive, it should be made clear that designated visitors including individuals designated by legally valid advanced directives, such as durable powers of attorney and health care proxies, should enjoy in visitation privileges that are no more restrictive than those that immediate family members enjoy. You should also provide that participating hospitals may not deny visitation privileges on the basis of race, color, national origin, religion, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, or disability. 
The rulemaking should take into account the need for hospitals to restrict visitation in medically appropriate circumstances, as well as in clinical decisions that medical professionals make about a patient's care or treatment. Uh, that's the end of the quote, and I must say that uh, the, the words are so similar to the new standard we put in place that it would be nice to think that actually they had seen that bef before they issued the, the directive. So uh, the, one can expect that there will be, I think, a, um, a, a rule being established by CMS that will correspond to uh, this element, this new element of performance. Uh, let me now turn this over to Amy to talk about the guide that I've m mentioned a number of times. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, just briefly to let everyone know, one of the things that I think Paul and I each experience when we speak to audiences about the new standards, and certainly indeed um, we hear this at the Joint Commission regarding any standard, is well, what, is it, what am I going to be expected to do? Um, and as Paul mentioned earlier, when we, when we took this project on, we realized that there was no guarantee that any standards would indeed be adopted. So we wanted to make sure that, there, that we had some way to catalog and capture all of the great information that we received from our experts and from the dialogue and research that we've been doing to better understand this issue. Um, hence, we now are um, in the process of, of finalizing uh, what we had previously been referring to as the Implementation Guide, which now actually has a bit more catchy title of Advancing Effective Communication, Cultural Competence, and Patient and Family-Centered Care, a Roadmap for Hospitals. And this, the information in this guide, um, as the slide sort of points out, it will help hospitals meet the intent of the standard. But I think it's, it's important for me to point out at this, at this juncture that um, it's not going to be a step-by-step, -step, this is what you do, because, again, one size does not fit all. So each organization is going to take a, have to take a step back and do some self-assessment to determine what their resources are, what their needs are, and what they're currently doing to meet um, the new standards. Also, uh, recognizing, as we did when we did this project, that many of the um, uh, issues that we wanted to address through this project were indeed already being addressed in our existing standards. However, we wanted to brought, draw additional attention to those standards and other standards that we haven't had time in this um, webinar to address. So the guide will not only address what we've covered today, but will also bring, it, bring readers back to other existing standards that support um, the idea of cultural competence, patient and family-centered care, and effective communication. We did also collect a lot of how-to information. So when I say there won't be step-by-step -step how to meet the standard, there will be step-by-step -step information about how you can address these issues. I think it's really important for um, folks to think about this in a broader context, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to bring Juana on to this webinar to speak a little bit about how um, at her organization they have proactively prepared themselves to um, meet the standards and meet the intent of the standards. I also want to emphasize that the roadmap document, the, the guide that we are developing, is going to be available for free. Um, it will be targeted to hospitals and it will be um, available on our website for free download. Um, and in addition to the information that we've put together in the, the, um, the guide, we also will include uh, many, many resources because there is a lot of information, there are a lot of existing guides and tools that there was no need for us to reinvent. So there will be um, a list of resources in that guide. Um, and Certainly, uh, the guide will be out at the end of May, so it should be available then, and likely we will um, uh, have an opportunity to uh, hear from the field about, uh, about any questions related to that guide. So I want to make sure that we have enough time to hear from Juana and also answer some of the questions that have come up. And so to end this, to, to, while I turn it over to Juana, I just want to sort of end our remarks right now with 
an emphasis on what all of this means. And, and the slide that is presented here is meant to, again, support this idea of a shared responsibility um, and the need to really integrate um, all of our efforts. In order to address disparities, which we do hope that these standards and believe that these standards will do, there really needs to be an integrated effort at multiple levels. And it needs to be an ongoing process and integrated into both patient safety and quality improvement initiatives. So really what and I don't know if this slide is going to work or not, but you see two circles here, two spheres. We talk a lot about health disparities, minority health, language access, cultural competence, health literacy, and social determinants of health. But at the same time, those are often, and those are often seen as some of the softer sides of these issues. But we're also looking at patient safety, evidence-based medicine, and evidence-based practice, and then organization systems that are important to support all of these issues. And what we really, we really are trying to say is these need to come together to, um, to, to make it all work towards uh, health equity. And wow, it actually worked. I hope it worked on the <laughs> webinar, but um, those two circles need to overlap. So with that, I would like to introduce or turn it over to Juana to talk to us and share a little bit about how she has um, begun to prepare her organization to meet these issues. And uh, Juana? Thank you, Amy. I'm uh, really delighted to have the opportunity to be on the call today with uh, you and Dr. Shivey. I think that it's important that we look at all of the, the issues on this page, that we consider the importance uh, of, of a collaborative approach or the benefits of a collaborative approach to health equity. And I think that we have the opportunity throughout the multi-year process that you have, have uh, introduced to the field, we have the opportunity to take a look at our organizations all across uh, the country to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place to uh, bring these circles uh, together in our organizations. Next slide. Amy? Thank you. Our preparation for improved patient provider communication uh, began before the Joint Commission's proposed standards were introduced to the field a few years ago. As background, AnMed Health has an inseparable has been an inseparable part of the Anderson community for more than a century. Since our modest beginning as a 25-bed hospital in 1908, our system delivery system, anchored by our 461-bed medical center, now includes a women's and children's hospital, a comprehensive cancer center, physicians' offices, and the cardiac and orthopedic center. Today we have affiliation agreements with Cannon Memorial in Pickens, South Carolina, and Carolina's healthcare system in Charlotte, North Carolina. Next slide. In 2001, AnMed Health was one of the first health care providers in the state to dedicate full-time resources to effective diversity management. Our mission and vision statements are clear. Our goal is to passionately blend the art of caring with the science of medicine, to optimize the health of our patients, staff, and the community, and to be recognized and celebrated as the gold standard for health care quality and community health improvement. Now, while these principles are important, Personally, I place real value on the 10 building blocks that serve to shape and define the day-to-day -day actions of the staff and the practices of our organization. Specifically, building block nine reinforces ANMED Health's commitment to diversity and inclusion. Block nine reminds us to recognize and respect the dignity and individual differences of all people, respect and protect the privacy of all patients, provide appropriate services to all patients regardless of who they are, remembering that we are all diversity challenged in one way or another. Based on our overall patient and employee satisfaction, clinical innovations, and industry recognition, we've been somewhat successful, despite what the demographics on this slide may say. However, historically, our primary market has been culturally, racially, and economically homogeneous. So as our community began to evolve, the leadership of AnMed Health saw strategic merit in effective diversity management. My department was established to work with system leaders, ensuring that every patient could benefit from our services, irrespective of cultural and linguistic preferences or sensory deficiencies. Tactically, we would implement a centralized language access system and develop a comprehensive cultural competency curriculum. Ultimately, we wanted to strategically correlate diversity, efficiency, quality, and over time, profit, profitability. 
Next slide. Some of you um, may not be able to identify with what I'm about to say, but diversity officers in small to mid-sized organizations like mine or those not affiliated with academic institutions may at times feel isolated or restricted in their ability to affect real system change. Fortunately, in my organization, collaborative solutions are encouraged and rewarded. We believe that a multidisciplinary approach to oft often yields an effective, efficient solution. This philosophy led our response to, to the proposed Joint Commission standards to improve patient care communication. This list represents the ANMED Health team members who helped to review our readiness on the proposed standards and related elements of performance. Eventually, we were able to use a list of the proposed standards as a tool to validate the systems of cultural and linguistic competence established throughout the previous seven years. This process was useful in helping to identify opportunities for both improvement and enhancement. Now, before we transition to the next slide, I'd like to bring your attention to the only bulleted slide on this page. Medical interpretation and translation services are costly. Irrespective of the size of your organization, I think we all agree. Therefore, providers like AnMed Health are challenged to establish customer-focused, cost-efficient communication programs. Accurate data is essential to the appropriate growth and development of any new business venture. Medical interpretation and translation services are no different. Now, in partnership with Medical Resource Management, the bulleted item on the page, we designed and implemented several tactical strategies or focus studies affording us the capability to quantify services, standardized data collection, and monitor and improve quality to limited and non-English proficient patients. At the conclusion of our assessment, we were fairly confident that we would be prepared irrespective of the Joint Commission's final standard additions or recommendations. Next slide, please. This is an example of the algorithm we created to document standard readiness. It includes just a few of the standards that have been revised or added. It is not a complete list, nor does it include proposed standards that were not approved. To be clear, in the second column, the roadmap is in reference to the implementation guide Amy referenced just a few moments ago. I'd like to conclude by telling you one thing. It was very gratifying to assess my organization's position against both the 14 class standards and the Joint Commission standards. Thank you. Amy? Thank you so much, Juana. Um, we have several um, questions that have come up. And uh, just to let everyone know that um, resources uh, related to uh, the new standards and the guide, when it, when it is available, will be available on our website. In addition, the reports that we referenced that we've already um, released are also available for download on that website, as well as um, many resources and links to other resources or links to other uh, websites that will be re useful to uh, folks. So, um, some of the questions that um, we've received, um, I think, uh, are very worthy of clarification. And the first one, most importantly, I know folks want to know when these standards are going to go into effect, and I'm going to ask that of Paul. Thanks. Um... Actually, this builds off the point that Juana made about the, the resource management. Uh, in developing the standards, uh, we spent time not only with the usual kind of field engagement uh, to find out uh, the reactions of people to the proposed standards, but actually carried out a number of, of pilot, you might say, focus groups with some organizations to find out in some detail, <coughs> excuse me, what it was going to require for them to do this. And just as in the field review, uh, people responded in a very positive way that these are things that should be done. These are things that they wanted to do, but there were concerns about uh, how, how to do them in terms of the resources. So when these standards were adopted, they were adopted without a date at which they become uh, a part of the accreditation decision. Uh, so we have official Joint Commission standards 
uh, which, which were published in the January issue of Perspectives. They will be in the 2011 hospital manual, but there will be an indication that they do not yet uh, factor into the accreditation decision. The surveyors will have been trained to survey these standards, and the surveyors will, in fact, survey the standards, all of which is designed to essentially carry out what you might consider to be a pilot implementation. How are people able to perform relative to these standards? What have people learned about the actual resources that it takes for them to do this? And based on that information, we, will, we expect we'll even be able to add to the, the roadmap that people can use to help them uh, in terms of implementing not just specific standards, but the goal that this all leads to. Uh, at this point, we have not uh, set the actual date at which it will begin to count in the accreditation decision process, but given the plan I just described, I'm assuming that that would not occur before January 1st, 2012. So we're, uh, we're hoping that people will, in fact, uh, do the best they can in a learning mode during 2011. We will be evaluating that, and then that will lead to the decision about uh, at what point do we start saying an organization's performance, a hospital's performance, will feed into the actual accreditation decision. Great. Thanks, Paul. Um, another question that's come up that I want to clarify, someone asked about um, how they might order the roadmap. The roadmap is going to be available for free. And um, if people would, if anyone would like to receive a notice of it, if you go to our website, which is on this last si slide, we have a listserv um, from our hospital's language and culture study. And we will certainly be sending notice out via that listserv. And it will probably be picked up by several of the other listservs as well as sent to all of the Joint Commission listservs when the roadmap is available. It will be um, a web-based uh, guide that will be downloadable in PDF form. I, let me add something to that, Amy. Uh, the, the first thing is, uh, as I indicated before, this is the first time that we've developed a, a roadmap or a guide to go along with the standards and issue them at the same time. Uh, so one of the things that I, I we will see that I think would be a good idea if we can do this is actually include that website and information in the standards manual along with the standards and we'll also explore whether in the e-edition of the standards there might actually be a link. I'm not sure whether technically we'll be able to do that but that would also be uh, an advantage it seems to me to literally be able to click on it and get directly to the roadmap when you're in the e-edition of the standards. Yes, and everyone participating in this webinar will indeed receive notification when the roadmap is available. Um, another question that has come up relates to um, the standard that ex uh, explains qualifications and it highlights qualifications for interpreters. And one of the questions that has been raised is, are all of the um, expectations in terms of training, language proficiency, and experience expected? Or is, how, how will the Joint Commission determine compliance with that? Uh, the Joint Commission, I, first let me say that I think people are still determining what the, what the best criteria would be and what the proficiency should be. So, for example, there's people that are working on the standards for that and how to, to test proficiency. At this point, it is going to be uh, essentially the responsibility of the individual hospital to decide how they would like to best judge the, the uh, proficiency, what kind of training is, is uh, expected, uh, and what those criteria will be. Part of that issue is going to be the, the issue of collecting data about how this is all working. And, and so part of the quality improvement around providing language services is going to be to, uh, to tell whether or not the proficiency judgments that are being made uh, matches up with uh, the experience that people are having with regard to the, uh, the uh, language. Uh, which, which reminds me, I noticed that uh, there was also a, uh, what I would call a related question about uh, do the standards address the language concordant bilingual providers? Uh, they do because the expectation that one looks at proficiency 
applies to anyone who's going to, in fact, being uh, go going to be uh, uh, providing care or, or interpreter services. In that particular case, they're not interpreting, but the question is some providers may, in fact, be very skilled in, in discussing the issue uh, in uh, the health care issues, and others may not. It goes back to the, the point I made earlier about uh, being bilingual does not necessarily mean that one has proficiency in terms of being able to address health care issues. So that would actually have to be a question that would be asked, not automatically assume that because someone spoke the same language as the patient, that that means that, that uh, they can serve effectively as an interpreter. But obviously, in, in many, if not most cases, one might well assume that's the case. But it, it is something that needs to be a judgment made about as opposed to automatically assuming it. Did you have anything to add to that? No, I would agree with you. I think that that, and some of, many of these issues are going to be further clarified in the guide in terms of building on work that are, and clarifications that have already been made by other experts. Um, one other question that has come up relates to translation of documents. Um, there is a section in the guide, an appendix actually, that um, really highlights and goes through quite thoroughly uh, legal and regulatory support for language access. And um, again, we did not want to reinvent the wheel, so there is guidance there relate from the Office for Civil Rights and their related guidance about translating documents. Um, and going back to what we've tried to iterate um, <laughs> several times, the, the need for an organization to, set, to assess its needs and determine, you know, based on its resources, what it can adequately uh, translate. Um, and Paul had emphasized earlier that uh, translation of information in written form is uh, very complicated and not something that should be done, you know, um, you know, at the point of care, but instead, you know, working with an interpreter to uh, communicate information to the patient, um, but not expecting the interpreter to do a sight translation in an immediate sense. Um, we're really trying to promote an education of what those different roles are and the distinctions and qualifications that are required for both. And actually, I should add, well, as Amy was saying that, it reminded me of one of the good practices, for example, that's been described is that uh, uh, even though you may have the document well translated, uh, that that it's not appropriate simply now to handle the, the hand the translated document to the patient uh, who now is unable to ask questions or, or un make sure they understand the document if, without an interpreter in the room. So when you give a translated document to someone, what you're usually doing actually is having both the, the, the work of the translator and an interpreter at the same time. Um, one of the other questions that came up is related to uh, requirements for collecting and race, race and ethnicity data. And a question um, is asked, two questions actually, do the requirements for, for collecting race and ethnicity data follow the OMB guidelines is the first question. And second to that is what resources might you recommend to collect data in a sensitive manner? Uh, the, uh, the requirements are that, that are in the standards are not so specific that they would uh, conflict in any way from the OMB guidelines. Um, the, uh, the guidelines are, are, however, not granular in terms of the ethnicity that's gathered and also uh, continue to be criticized in terms of uh, the ability for people to identify with uh, a specific race or combination with races, of races. So there is currently uh, within the federal government uh, some uh, discussion about whether those categories uh, need to be rethought. Secondly, and this is a part of the answer to the second half of that question, where might you get guidance about this? The uh, Institute of Medicine uh, a couple months ago issued a subcommittee report 
on the collection of racial and ethnicity and language data for health care purposes and recommended that uh, perhaps I would say at a minimum one does collect the data in the OMB categories, but for uh, health care purposes really need to have data that's collected at what's called a granular ethnicity. Currently, the OMB categories have only two ethnic groups, Hispanic and non-Hispanic. And that doesn't really address issues that relate more to cultural questions uh, or to questions about uh, national origin, which are reflected oftentimes in more granular ethnicity. So that report, that subcommittee report available from the Institute of Medicine might actually be helpful to people to, to look at what those re recommendations are. The second thing is that there are some guidelines now that are actually referenced in the roadmap to how one might go about collecting uh, race and ethnicity data. Uh, a few years ago, uh, excuse me, the Joint Commission had actually proposed the standard that talked about collecting race and ethnicity data. And the response we got in the field review was, that's a good idea, but uh, there's not much information out there about how to do that. And there were a lot of concerns about whether it could be done well. I think those, the, the answers to those concerns are now available, which is one reason why something that wasn't placed in standards a few years ago is now seen as appropriate as a standard. Great, thanks. I'd like to now ask a question of Juana. Um, Juana, are there any specific tools available to review that you use um, at your organization during your assessment of your institution and the population? And do you have this information available on your website? Uh, no, I don't have it available on the, web, on the website, but one of the things that, that we did, we used uh, primarily our internal infrastructure, what we call our uh, Diversity Advisory Council. Uh, those are the individuals who are in the various departments, uh, the nursing units, who could provide information back to us to help us uh, com complete the assessment process. Um, if you remember back to the example of the assessment tool, um, each member of that team was given an opportunity to look for tactics that they were familiar with in the organization, and then we could then report back on how effective those tools were and those tactics, tactics had been. Great. Thank you. I have another question for Paul. How will standard RI-0101 EPY, which is related to uh, visitation and access to a support person, how will that affect hospitals with strict ICU visitation hours? And additionally, does this mean that there will be no prohibitions of age in terms of allowing children into the ICU? Uh, good questions. Uh, remember that the, the, the first thing is that there is a um, uh, a caveat, you might say, within that note that talks about patient safety. So uh, it is certainly appropriate for a hospital to look at its policies and uh, determine whether there's a certain age that might be at risk, both in terms of, of behavior within the ICU and also between, uh, with regard to risk with regard to infection and so on. Uh, so the, that, the judgment about age uh, can be made by the organization. Uh, the, the, uh, the second question about uh, somebody being essentially there regardless of what's going on, again, it's the caveat that's, uh, that needs to be taken into account. In some ways, um, I think the issue here is that people have been uh, re uh, recognizing increasingly that the ICU is often a time when the patient, in fact, may need the most support, and frankly, the family also needs the most support when the family member is in the ICU. Uh, and consequently, it's, it's uh, often to the benefit of both the patient and the family for, the, uh, for a family member to be able to be in the ICU. And we have 
certainly in the United States, tended to have a policies that go almost in the other direction. So uh, maybe in a way to think about what that standard is saying is uh, the culture should be one in which uh, a patient, an, an advocate or family member can be with the patient as much as possible, and yes, there will need to be some exceptions, as opposed to uh, the, the often culture at this point is, no, the family member or advocate can't be with the patient with some exceptions. Thank you. Um, one other question. NCQA is in the process of rolling out their multicultural health care standards and guidelines. Has the Joint Commission looked to see if there's any overlap between the two standards, and are there any plans for possible collaboration between NCQA and the Joint Commission, given that both hospitals and health plans are stakeholders who could work together? Uh, the, the answer first is that uh, actually we were aware of the standards that they were working on as our technical expert panel was developing the standards. Secondly, by coincidence, coincidence just last week, uh, Peggy O'Kane, the head of MCQA, and I, and Helen Burston from NQF, who also issued a set of, of uh, recently of, of uh, practices for uh, language and cultural differences, uh, that uh, all three of us were presenting together on a panel to try to talk about how these things link together. So, uh, can I? Can I assure you that it's all perfectly linked? The answer is no, but uh, we're certainly, I think, all three of us well aware of that and, and at least trying to keep them consistent with each other. And I'll just, this is Amy, and I'll just add to that that um, we're aware that NCQA had a uh, webinar also sponsored by the Your Voice Project recently, and um, we've been in contact with them just to talk and keep each other abreast of our activities in this area so that we can indeed learn from one another and our experiences. Um, we also do want to be able to share uh, best practices as much as possible, and I know NCQA has put together some guides um, and resources that we will be referencing in our roadmap. Amy, this is Julia. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we've probably got time for about one more question. Great. Thank you. Let me see. What will the final question be? Hopefully something we can answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a question that's asking for a clarification. Will hospitals be accountable for um, RC020101 and RI010101 EPs discussed in this webinar effective 1-1-2011? It sounds like you're saying they won't be for effect responsible for the bilingual staff standard at that time, but I'm unsure about these other new standards and when do they become part of the accreditation decision process? Uh, all the new standards that uh, were published in the perspectives that were on these uh, slides and were underlined and indicated as new, all those standards uh, are ones that will be voluntarily uh, available to the field starting January 1, 2011. In fact, you could obviously begin working on those uh, today. Uh, but uh, none of those that were underlined uh, would be, in fact, counting in the accreditation decision uh, until that specific date has been set, which uh, will not be January 1st, 2011. Uh, I do, on the other hand, need to remind you that, uh, if you recall, we said that there are other standards that deal with some of these issues that are in the manual now, uh, and and there were, uh, even on the slides, things that weren't underlined, which were existing uh, standards. Obviously, they are in effect now for accreditation purposes and will continue to be. I want to thank everybody for the opportunity to uh, present this information. So thank you, Julia, for putting this together for us. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, Paul. And thank you, Juana. You guys have done a terrific job, and I'm sure you've given people both a lot of information as well as um, generated a lot of a lot more questions that they might have. And as the participants probably realize, we weren't able to get to all of the questions that you've um, sent in to us, but we have them all. And we're going to be forwarding those questions to the Joint Commission team so that they can um, 
take a take a, a little bit of time to answer some more of them, and then when we have their answers, we'll be putting them back up on our website so that you can um, so that you can see the answers to them. We'll also be emailing them to you. 